Welcome to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show, built by Par Lumber. When it comes to big or small projects around the home, Tony and Corey have got the know-how and the answers to make your life just a bit easier. Here they are, your Weekend Warriors, Tony and Corey. Hey, welcome to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show, built by Par Lumber. I'm Corey Valdez. And I'm Tony Cookston. Thanks for tuning in with us today. We've got another great show lined up for you. Tony, we have a special guest in the studio with us. We do. We have a great guest, and we're going to be talking about home improvement. Because one way to improve your home is to add a little bit of joy and happiness. Sounds nice. Yeah, but how do you do that? Well, we need to talk to the guest that we have in the studio with us because she is an expert on indoor house plants. Uh, we've got Erin Harding. She's an author, blogger, uh, DIY care and decor of interior plants. Yes. She's also the creator and editor at cleverbloom.com. Erin, how are you? I'm good. How are you guys? Fantastic. Doing great. Good. Yeah, we're super excited to talk about indoor plants because I think that people think about indoor plants and they think um, any plant will do and maybe I just need two and we'll put one in that corner of the house and one in that corner of the house. And then if it dies, it's okay. It wasn't very expensive anyways. And then maybe they don't give a lot of thought to the actual benefits of having indoor plants and they are vast really. Um, so we want to talk about some of that stuff and uh, maybe we can inspire some of our listeners to get out and get some house plants. I'd love yes. that. So you wrote a book about house plants and it's called how to raise a house plant. Let's see here. And make it love you back. I love that title. <laughs> I do too. It's great. It's absolutely great. We, uh, I want to know about this book, how you wrote it, how you got into this. Let's talk a little bit about that. Where, how did sure. you get into house plants? Well, it's funny. I don't think I intentionally got into house plants, but um, after moving out of my folks' house and moving into my first home that I had with a roommate, Honestly, after paying rent, it's like we had maybe $10 to our name and we were really trying to just make our house a home. And so we went to a local grocery store and I think we were planning on maybe buying dinner that night or something, but we had a couple dollars left over and we were walking out and we saw this plant and it's actually called the pregnant onion plant. Ooh. <laughs> I'm going to save you from the, the actual Latin uh, name of that plant. But uh, it's a plant that looks kind of like an onion at the bottom. And then it sort of has this foliage that goes up the top. But then it produces these tiny little babies that grow all throughout the soil. And so one of the things uh, we, we bought it and we put it in our house. And that was our very first piece of decor. So that was... Uh, not to age myself, but 20 some odd years ago. So mm -hmm. that's kind of when that started. And then it seemed like every time we got a paycheck, you know, we had a few dollars left over. So we would buy a house plan. So that's kind of how that started. That's really cool. I remember when I was in college back in the late 90s, it was the same thing for me. I didn't get, uh, I didn't know, I had no idea what the names of those plants were, but I did enjoy having a house plant or two in the home. Well, it, I think for somebody who's single, right, and doesn't have other things that are living things in the home, <laughs> <laughs> depending on them to keep them alive, uh, a plant is the natural thing to go to, right? You can buy a plant and then you can try your hand at um, taking care of the plant and growing the plant and making it do all of those things that plants do when they're taken care of properly. But in my experience, when I compare myself to both of you, I had a very difficult time keeping my indoor plants alive. Well, there's something to be said about bringing a plant into the home and, and just instantly having life into the home, like you said. And so I really feel like if you are drawn to a, a particular plant, you know, get it, try it out. Um, but not all of us have a green thumb, so it's okay. You, you can always, you know... Trial and error. You can always you can always learn. But I think that's one of the biggest things is, um, you know, whether you use it for decor or honestly, like we get the blues around here a lot with uh, tons of rain and clouds and just the weather that we get in the Pacific Northwest. And so one of the things I noticed um, about my own home is that the more plants I brought into it, 
the less I got those winter blues. And I think that really had a big, you know, part in that. So. Really brightens the mood. It oh, yeah. I, I agree with that completely. We spend so many months cooped up because it's cold and rainy and dark early yeah. and dark late. And uh, I think that we you spend so much time in the house. I know Corey and I talk about this on the show a lot uh, through the winter months. You want to open the doors, open the windows, open the win- you know the blinds, and and let stuff in. But there's just nothing out there. Right. <laughs> in the winter months, there's nothing out there. And by the end of the winter, you just you just want to open the whole place up and you know spring clean the entire house. But I can I can see how some of those feelings would be suppressed if you had some life inside the house that was keeping things bright and fresh. That's uh, that's a great perspective. It's it's nice, and I have you know I have a friend in Florida who. You walk the streets in Florida and you see things that we can only keep alive inside our house here. So we would never be able to keep certain types of plants alive outside here. But to be able to bring those into your home just creates this sort of tropical atmosphere almost inside yeah. your home. So yeah, That's a, kind of what it feels like. I have a buddy that works at Par Lumber Company that um, actually bought an orange tree <laughs> <sighs> bought an orange tree and brought it into his house. And I remember him telling me, I bought an orange tree this weekend. I'm like, what are you going to do with an orange tree? Yeah. It's too cold. He goes, no, 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 inside the house. And he had been reading up on how to take care of this orange tree that he had inside of his house. And I remember following uh, up with him over and over and over. And finally, it happened. It produced about One. Six, oh, six. six oranges. And uh, it's Casey Doss. And he was very, very excited that That's he impressive. was able to do that. You can do oranges, lemons, uh, limes. Those are pretty popular around here um, because that's not stuff we can typically do outdoors. But if you can control your environment indoors, you got your lemons and your limes. You know, that's uh, lemon and lime trees might work out pretty well in my household. Yeah, I think the only thing that I would worry about, and we can talk about this some more as we're talking about controlling the environment and and how to take care of those things. I think that uh, my number one concern would be bugs. Right. Will will it attract bugs or or I don't know create bugs uh, that end up being in your house that wouldn't be there otherwise? You think and, trees create bugs? Well, I don't know. I feel like <laughs> they're not there, and then the trees there, and then they're there. So uh, did they or 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 what? So you know we could talk about Which some of that first, stuff. Which came first, the bug or the tree? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that kind of uh, is a is a great topic. Another very funny thing that goes right along with this, and I'm going to test Corey out here. Corey, have you ever bit into an apple and and saw that there had been a worm inside the apple? Oh, of course, yeah. And I think so, everybody has. And so you thought to yourself, "Oh man, a worm crawled into this apple." I wonder if I'm going to eat the worm, right? I'm going to stop eating it because I'm afraid I'm going to bite through a worm. Did you know that worms do not crawl into apples? They do not. The worm starts in the apple at the bud, and then the fruit is created around the worm, and then the wormhole is created when the worm crawls out. I didn't know and that. And there you have it, folks. There you have There's There's one thing I know about trees and fruit. That's one thing I know. So if there's a... If there's a wormhole in an apple, he's already gone. I have found bugs in fruit. <laughs> I will say that. Okay, this is an awesome topic, and I'm super excited to get into it with you, Aaron. Um, but we got to take a quick break. You're listening to Tony and Corey, your weekend warriors, and don't go away. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show built by Par Lumber. Today we're talking about house plants. You know, it's kind of not far off the Weekend Warrior path a little bit, you know, uh, because I really enjoy house plants as a Weekend Warrior, but I don't know anything about them. So we've got an expert in the studio with us. We've got Erin Harding. She's the uh, author and blogger at Clever Bloom. And uh, first, first segment, we learned a little bit about Erin. Now let's learn a little bit about house plants and how to choose them and how to take care of them. You wrote a book. It's called How to Raise a Plant and Make It Love You Back. And it's really filled with so much information, a lot of specific plants. So I kind of want to dig into this a little bit and find out. I really want to know what your favorite plant is. Oh, is, that, is that a hard question? I was afraid you were going to ask me that. <laughs> it's not fair. You can't it's ask like, someone. Okay. It's like flip through the pages. Their favorite. And go, Stop. 
Who's your favorite child? You have two children, Corey. Who's Ooh, your favorite child? I do have a favorite. Oh, <laughs> you're not supposed to have favorites. But Aaron will let you have a favorite plant. So Depends on the day. Well, I like plants that are easy to care for um, and that are a little bit forgiving. Um, my favorite plant right now, I would say, is a Hoya plant. And we talk about that in the book. But there's tons of different species of Hoya. So one of the fun things that I like to do is try to collect them all. You know, it's like Beanie Babies or, you know, Pokemon cards or whatever. <laughs> so uh, Hoya is one specific type of plant. And I think there's probably maybe upwards of like 400 different varieties. Holy so cow. I won't get my hands on them all, but the the hope is there. But um, so that's kind of a fun part about the plants, too, is being able to collect different ones. Um, some are a lot more rare than others. And so that's a, a fun thing. Um, I would say the Hoya is my favorite because they um, are closer to the succulent family. Um, but they don't require as much light as succulents do. And you only have to water them about once every in the summertime, every three weeks or so and in the winter time maybe once every two months so oh wow so this this begs the question and i know that if you're in tune with your plants then you know what they need you're checking on them every day and that's important to you so it's easier for you but for someone that wants to have plants that are doing good but really isn't as in tune do you suggest that somebody put together a schedule for all the different plants and when they should be getting water and when they should be getting sunlight? I mean, I feel like that's a lot to remember. I went and bought a plant at Al's Garden Center and we I got a snake plant. Are you familiar with that? Oh, yeah. Bought a snake plant and I said to the person there, hey, can you tell me how to take care of it? There's a little card that comes with it and says some stuff, but I wanted to get some advice from a real human being. And and he started telling me about all of the things. This is the time for this, and this is the time for this, and not too often on this, and don't forget not to do this. I mean, you can make sure you take it out of this and put it in this, but not in that. And I got very, I felt overwhelmed I'm so I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that that plant's dead now? No, no, it's not. No, it's not because, because we took good notes and we've been on it. But I'm thinking now, as I compare my snake plant, my one snake plant, to all of the plants that Erin has in her home and all of their different varying needs, I start to become overwhelmed in my mind. How, what, how could I possibly deal with that? Yeah. So one of the biggest things that I, so, so it's not intimidating for people, right? Because I want people to bring plants into their home. So one of the first things um, is I say, where are your windows located? And for me, that's the very first thing I look at is I have a south facing window and I have a west facing window, which is perfect for plants. Uh, the north and the east facing window, um, you would have to put lower light plants there. But so I have my two big windows, west and south facing. That's how I first know what kind of plants to bring into my home because I know what kind of light I have. Um, second of all, Instead of just going to the plant shop and saying, I want a house plant and that one looks pretty, picking it up and <laughs> yeah. taking it home, yeah. I do my research ahead of time. So I'll, I'll either look on like Instagram or Pinterest or Google and I'll um, Google different types of plants. And what I'll do is I'll see one that looks pretty. And then I look at what the care needs are for that particular plant. And so at that point, I know, well, that needs higher light levels. I can't provide that for this plant. So this is not the right plant for me and, and so on. So that's the first thing I suggest is really knowing your environment, knowing what you can provide plants and then going, going from there. Um, so I have, it looks like a lot of plants and it is compared to most people, but everything is in front of my West window and in front of my South window. And in fact, don't tell my husband this, but I've also taped the vents off in front of those windows <laughs> so that the plants don't get drafts either. But um, that's that's the biggest thing is knowing what your conditions are, what you can provide for the plant, and knowing then what type of plant to bring into your home. Well, that makes that's, absolutely perfect sense. It does, but it does seem like a lot. For instance, like Tony said, he has one. My wife has started to buy a lot more plants ever since reading your book. So she, she messaged me. I hope you know. <laughs> she, I'm, I think she did. Yeah. So uh, yeah, she's the one that told me to get a hold of you initially, because yeah, she's she loves the house plants. But for the longest time, we were on this different schedule of watering, and it really, truly is different 
for each plant, like you said, a, a certain plant might you water every three to four weeks, where some plants you kind of need to water a lot more often. Right. So there's there's sort of four main components of having a healthy plant that I look at. One is light, one is water, one is soil, and then the container. Um, so for instance, we were talking about succulents earlier. One of the big things about succulents or cacti, having those in the home is number one, absolute self-facing window. Um, if you have it in any other window, you're going to get a lot of the stretching. So oftentimes I'll have people say, look at my cactus is growing, but really it's stretching. It's reaching. It's looking for the light. And so that's actually not really growing well. Um, so what you want to make sure you do is first have the right container. So anything out of clay, terracotta, that is the best for like a succulent or a cactus. Um, and then well draining soil is really important. You can use different amendments if you want, perlite, um, pumice, different things to mix in with regular potting soil, but that water has to drain out and it can't stay in the soil. Plants like that need to be completely dried out before you water them again. Um, And then other plants like tropicals, some monstera or um, like pothos plants or whatever, they need a little bit more um, water, moisture. (laughs) They do. Uh, And so one of the things is those you can use plastic uh, containers for those. You can use different types of uh, clay for those because the moisture control is, is, is good for those types of plants. But being on a schedule is hard for plants. It's kind of like kids, right? If they're hungry, you sort of have to feed them, even if it's not <laughs> lunch or dinner time. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> so what I do is I say, it's kind of cheesy, but get to know your plant, right? Feel it when you first buy it. What does it feel like? Because it was well taken care of at the greenhouse or at the shop. So feel it. Feel what the uh, foliage feels like and look how perky it is and and so on. So when you start to see signs of moisture distress, the drooping, curling under of leaves, um, you might see some succulents start to shrivel up a little bit, that's when it's time to water. So you can't really technically be on a schedule. But one thing I do is I I group all like plants together in my house. So all my cacti and succulents are in my south-facing window, and then all my tropicals are in my west-facing window. That's a really good idea. Yeah, so when you're in that area and you're looking at those plants, you're likely to see multiple plants reacting the same way to the same environment because you water them at like times and they get like amount uh, like amounts of sun so i have one particular plant that we have really struggled with inside the house and i'm sure you will not be surprised by this uh so i want to ask you about this particular plant and how to take care of it right after this break you're listening to tony Corey, your weekend warriors we'll be right back Tony and Corey here with the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show, built by Par Lumber. Hey, Corey. Hey, what's up, man? Hey, have you seen our new YouTube channel? Um, of course I have. Haven't you subscribed to it yet? Uh, yeah, totally. Is that a yes or a no? Well, I don't really know how, so... Look, it's easy. All you have to do is go to www.homeshow.com and click on the YouTube link. Hit subscribe, and you're good to go. Uh, but my arms are too short. Oh, come on. It's not that hard. I think I got bit by a spider. What? Are you okay? No. Yeah, I'm fine. Hey. Hey. Hey, hey does my head look big to you? No? You don't think so? Well, whatever. Tune in this weekend. You'll definitely get a laugh, and you'll likely get some good advice, but only if you listen. Hey, welcome back to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show. Thanks for staying with us. If you haven't already, go check out our Facebook, YouTube, Instagram pages. We're at WW Home Show. We're recording this show right now with Aaron Harding sitting in the studio with us. It's going to be all over YouTube here shortly. So uh, go check that out and you can watch our video podcast 
Uh, hit subscribe, hit like, leave some comments. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah. So today we're talking about houseplants. We're with uh, Erin Harding. She's the author and blogger at Clever Bloom. She wrote the book, How to Raise a Plant and Make It Love You Back. Yes. Which is, uh, I mean, it's perfect. Because I have tried to raise um, one type of plant uh, several times, not able to make it love me at all. And so um, I'm looking for some advice from you um, about this particular plant. And I know there's so many, but um, I really love a, blue, a cactus. No, I really love, I do love cactus too. I really love a Christmas cactus in bloom. Uh, they're so beautiful. And that's the time of year, especially that's the time of year that there's not a lot of that going on right. inside the house. And so maybe that's why I have such an affinity for it. But I have struggled with my Christmas cactus in the past trying to keep it. Well, honestly, I think I think that I'm not watering it enough. And then I find out maybe that I'm watering it too much. And I, I just need some tips um, on a Christmas cactus and how maybe to give it the best love. Yeah. Well... I think your problem is uh, you probably overwatered it. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. <laughs> it's, it's honestly the number one mistake that most houseplant parents uh, make is overwatering their plants. But specifically with yours, uh, like you said, it is a succulent. And so one of the things that is really important is number one, the soil it's in. It has to be well draining. And oftentimes when you purchase a plant from a, any shop, um, they've used sort of a, a moisture control because that's how they're able to really root plants quickly. But then once you bring it into your home, it doesn't have those either grow lights or highlights or, you know, greenhouse atmosphere. So you have to really adapt the plant to your home. So the first thing I would probably do is repot it out of the plastic nursery pot. <laughs> I would. Hey, wait, how did you know it was still in that? <laughs> I would probably uh, do a soil that was high in pumice or perlite. And then I would repot it into probably terracotta. Uh, the terracotta actually helps the soil to breathe and it actually pulls moisture out of the soil. And so that's probably going to be your best bet. Um, it also requires higher light levels. So you're going to want to get it as close to that south facing window as you possibly can. Okay. Which is tough for Tony that because is he lives in a cave. <laughs> uh, well, it's not entirely true, but I do, uh, I do in the wintertime, especially, I like to keep the drapes. You know, here's in my the middle thing. of summer. Here you need a headlamp. To maneuver through Tony's house. This is the truth. They're if you, vampires. If you have the, in the middle of summer, right, you're either running your air conditioner in order to keep the house cool, or you're pulling your drapes closed to keep the, the solar heat gain from, from increasing Rising. the temperature inside the house. So I have blackout drapes in my house on all windows. I don't always have them closed, but in the summertime, I do during the day, and it's dark in there, but it keeps my house super cool. And uh, I don't have to run an air conditioner all the time. So I like that. But he's true. I do have a tendency to not open them up as much as I should. Well, one of the big things, too, is knowing your your amount of water is equal to the amount of light it's getting. So if you're not giving it as much light, don't give it as much water. Mm. And for something like that, I would let the soil completely dry out, stay dry for a bit, and then water. Okay, so here's another question. I've Let's say I've taken it out of the plastic nursery pot that I bought it in, and I've put it in a terracotta pot. And this terracotta pot has one of those little plates underneath. What do you call it? The yeah, saucer. Saucer, okay, mm -hmm. underneath. Do you pour the water into the soil in the plant, or do you put the water in the saucer and let it pull it from the bottom? I've heard both ways. Really? Yeah. Water bottoming, or bottom watering. Bottom watering. Bottom water, 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 water bottoming. Water bottoming. <laughs> <laughs> Bottom it's kind of like waterboarding, but, but just a little <laughs> but bit. But it's a little bit different. Yeah. Just a little. Uh, so you can do both, but what I prefer to water thoroughly from the top. So again, 
you want to sort of mimic its natural environment. Um, and even though there is a lot of moisture and water in the ground, it it's coming from the moisture and the rain that falls from the sky, right? So there, most plants that we have inside are used to the, the rain. And so that's kind of how we want to mimic that. So I typically water from the top. They do have some new things these days, which is like, a string that you can stick up the hole in the bottom of the pot and it can kind of come out and then it pulls water from the saucer and it does bottom water. Okay. There's some new things on the market right now. So it's worth a shot to try them. Uh, but you know, old school way is just sort of watering them from the top. Make sure you see the water come out of the drainage hole and then stop watering at that point. If there's any leftover water in the saucer, you have to dump it because oh. any excess water in the bottom uh, could really cause root rot. And that's something that we don't want. Right. That mm. is uh, most almost certainly. I can already tell you of the four things you told me I needed to do. I've done all four of them wrong uh, <laughs> because this is what I know. I know that the dirt is not um, super drainy. Right. We well, don't. Do you uh, have perlite or no. what was the other one you call it? If it doesn't like look lava, like a right? desert, then you don't have the right, right. stuff. Yeah. yeah. It's very more solid dirt, you know, and you pour the water in. It kind of sits up on top for a little while and yeah. then it soaks in. And like three hours later, maybe you see a little bit of water coming out of the right. bottom. And then when it does come out of the bottom, I definitely didn't drain or dump it out. Yeah. And so, so many problems, right? So many problems. And, and, just that short conversation, I'm already realizing so many things. It's so important that the water can get in, soak up, and get out, and then be gone. That's it. It gets its water, and then you don't force it to sit in like a pool of water. Exactly. Until the water dissipates into the air a week later or something. So let's talk a little bit about repotting. You said Tony needed to repot that and put, what did you call it, perlite? And what was the other one? Pumice. 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 Perlite. Is that, what is Lava rock. I mean, there's lots of... I feel like it's it's like it's like pumice, it's, but it's white maybe. Is yeah, it like the, it's the really little light, airy sort of rock? Styrofoamy. Yeah, yeah. So what it like does that. is it creates air pockets inside the soil, and so if you don't use amendments like that, then it's just basically potting soil. soil, and that's it. Okay. Uh, but different plants require different types of soil. So, for example, like a tropical plant like a monstera which is the plant on the cover of our book. That, Beautiful. That one, um, along with a lot of different philodendrons and, and things that we typically see inside houses, um, those are tropical plants. And that what I use for those is like orchid bark. I put some of that in there. I put some perlite in there. It needs, um, their roots are a lot thicker, and so they need more space to sort of maneuver around the soil. So every type of plant sort of requires a different type of potting soil. So that's why it's important, too. You don't want to mix them up, yeah. right? Um, and also the type of water uh, that you use and the amount of water you give it is you, you kind of see that as it drains. You, you do a quick water at the top, watch it drain out. If it drains fast you're good. You're, you don't want to water anymore. If it takes a little bit of time, that may mean it needs more water. So hmm. just depending on, of course, whether or not it's has the proper type of soil in there and it's right. drainy so that the water can actually get through. If it's if you're pushing on it and your finger's not going into the soil, yeah, it's probably time to repot that. Plant. Right. And that's a big that's a big thing about repotting, too, is that you'll, you'll see the signs immediately. And, and you'll know that you've put the right stuff in there and you're on the right track. We've got to take another quick break. I can't believe it. We're going to be right back to listen to Tony Corey, your weekend warriors. Don't go away. Tony and Corey, your weekend warriors with a great quick tip for you. Corey and I are here building this uh, mobile collapsible workbench and we were just cutting two by four, inch and a half thick with his circular saw. Most circular saws come with an adjustable depth 
cut. And you need to have an inch and a half or two inches to cut through two by four, but we're moving now to three quarters of an inch plywood. And we wanna shallow up the depth of that cut so that that blade is not hanging out there when we're cutting something, potentially interacting with something that's underneath the surface that we're working with. It can be dangerous, and this is a safety measure that you should use every opportunity you get. Thanks for tuning in, folks. We'll catch you next time. Hey, welcome back to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show. Thanks for staying with us. Today in the show, we've got Erin Harding in the studio with us. She's an author and blogger, a DIY care and decor professional of interior plants. She's the creator and editor at cleverbloom.com. She's also uh, on social media at cleverbloom if you're interested. We'll have all of those links on our website, which is uh, www.homeshow.com. And uh, yeah, we're glad to have you in here because we've been talking about caring for your plants mostly and how terrible Tony is at caring for plants. I mostly. am terrible. I have a question for you. Yeah. This is totally off the cuff. You ready for this? When you had, when you wrote the book and you had to make the decision about what was going to be on the cover, how did you choose the Monstera plants? I don't know if we had as much say in it as our publisher did, <laughs> oh, but okay, all right. we took photos of our favorite plants in our home and we ended up sending them a bunch of pictures and that was the one that was picked. So. I'll tell you what, I love this plant. I mean, I don't have one, but I'm going to now, but it definitely, you said it's a tropical plant. Mm -hmm. It definitely looks like a tropical plant. and It uh, really does. I really absolutely love that. And knowing I've seen this before, of course, and knew that I liked it, but I didn't ever think that it was something I could have in a pot right. you in know, my the house. Quick story real quick. The the very first time I saw that plant, uh, I used to work at the Reserve Golf Course many years ago, and they had like a 30-foot Monstera. And I just remember thinking, wow, what a difference that giant plant makes in this restaurant or in this golf course. And so... Um, one day there was a tiny little leaf that was growing out of the bottom and I, you know, looked behind me and <laughs> made sure no one was looking and I plucked it out and I actually took it home and I rooted it in water and it grew and it grew and it grew. And unfortunately I had to give it away one time when I moved, but I mean, it's just an amazing plant that multiplies and it's super easy to propagate. So, wow, that is, that that's is a great story actually. You had a start off of a Monstera from the Reserve Golf Course, where most people aren't even allowed <laughs> to walk in. There. You have to be Richie Rich just I to get in there. I was allowed to work there 40 hours <laughs> yeah. a week, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's a great story. I love that. Uh, it's a great looking plant. I'm going to definitely have to get me one of those. Monstera. Um, so we were talking about watering, and, and we need to talk a little bit more about that. But let's combine that with you bring a plant home from the plant store uh, or wherever, right? The nursery. And the first thing you want to do is repot that plant. So, so let's talk a little bit about the pot that you're going to put it in. You said terracotta for a Christmas cactus, uh, which I think is great. It, are, there's different types of pots that you do or don't want to use when you're choosing your pot for this particular plant, whatever it is. Yeah, you know, the first thing I do when I bring a plant home is I actually quarantine it for about a week or two away from all the other plants. You you sort of touched on uh, pests a little bit earlier. And one of the main things is oftentimes when you bring a plant home, because it's around so many and it, other plants, you, you might bring little critters home. So I have a particular table in my kitchen that's far away from everything where we eat and everything. And that's where I put plants for about a week or two before I do anything with them. I keep them away from all the other plants and I inspect them sort of every few days to make sure I don't see anything. Um, once that happens, it's time to repot. And I use terracotta a lot in my home because we live in the Northwest and we're moist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so it's, we don't dry out as quickly as other um, areas. So I, I often use terracotta on most plants, uh, but there are other types of material you can use, different clays and plastic and things like that, that can also work. The biggest thing I do is just make sure, basically, if it's any type of succulent or cactus, you definitely want to put it in a terracotta, and then other things you can kind of uh, go into other types of pots. But uh, once you've decided what kind of soil you need for it as well, you can mix it up or you can go to your local nursery and say, hey, I need cactus soil or 
it comes pre-mixed so you can buy it like that. Uh, and then you want to sort of gently pull the nursery pot from the bottom and you're going to get probably one of two things. Either it's going to be really root bound, which means basically all you see is roots. You don't even see a lot of soil. And it, that's definitely means it's probably was, was propagated in there and then it was never repotted. Mm -hmm. So once you get it out of there, uh, you break up the roots a little bit and you're not going to hurt them. So if you rip a few off, it's not a big deal. <laughs> so just make sure you're you're sort of pulling some of the old soil off and you're also sort of just pulling the roots apart a little bit so they have space to grow. And what I do is I look at the root system. How big is it? I do not pot it in a pot that's any bigger than about two inches around the entire root system. Mm. So, for example, uh, if the root system is as big as the palm of my hand, that probably means I'm going to put it in about a four to six inch pot. Um, you, The more soil you have in a pot versus roots, uh, the more likely you're to get root rot and things like that. So we definitely want to try to prevent that. Oh, hmm. interesting. Yeah, I did not know that. And so from there, you just do about an inch or two of soil at the bottom, stick your plant in there, and then continue to fill. And you don't want to really tamp it in there too much because it needs, the roots need to breathe. And so you just want to sort of lightly, and sometimes you can tap it on the table too, to just sort of have the soil fill in. And then um, I always do a preventative pest control every time I repot a plant. So I use it like a systemic granule inside the soil. And I, knock on wood, have not had any problems with pests in uh, in years uh, ever since using that. So that's something you continue to put in about every two to three months. And then you just water like normal. And then that sort of goes into the soil and it goes into the roots. And then So it's just like a granule or something you buy in a bag that you sprinkle on right. top? Yep. Hmm. That's it. And then obviously finding the placement for the plant. You want to do that ahead of time. But then once you know it's pest free, you didn't bring anything into your house, then you can go ahead and put it in front of the proper window. That that's, is a, that's it's way more involved than I thought. Yeah. I, I mean, I can absolutely see the passion that you have uh, for plants, which is amazing. And I, I, I want to, I want to be a better plant parent. I know. I want to talk I more really about do. the watering okay. because you know, in the beginning of the show, Tony had made mention of having a schedule. You know, this plant I water every two weeks, and this plant I water every three weeks, and this plant I water once a week. But you kind of blew that whole thing out of the water. And you said, actually look like your mind is blown right now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I really did get kind of blown away there because I thought that's how you watered things. You just water it every day or water it once a week or whatever. I never thought to look at the plant itself and say, Okay, it's looking a little shriveled up. Now it's time to water it. Or, you know, the soil's super dry. Or I guess how, what is the best way for a majority of plants? I think you'll probably get to know them. Sure. Right? You'll you'll say, okay, that plant is typically ready for water every two weeks, but it, not necessarily, narrowly, right? Right. Well, seasonally, you can say, on average, you would water, let's say, a snake plant, um, maybe once every two weeks or so. And going into the fall, you need to drag that out a little bit and maybe once every three weeks and so on and so on. But the biggest thing is every house is different. Some people use heat. Some people use AC. You just never know the environment. So one of the things that you want to make sure is like as cheesy as it sounds, get to know your plant when you bring it home. Feel the leaves. Feel the fo foliage. Try to find out uh, what it looks like when it's in its best condition, right? And then that's what you want it to to continue look like to look all the like, time. Right? Yeah. So when you see, for instance, succulent leaves starting to shrivel a little bit, you definitely waited too long to water. It's time to water. Um, my favorite plant, the Hoya plant, it starts to get uh, a little bit soft and you can see it. It's still, the leaves are pretty hard still, but you can feel that it's a lot softer than it's time to water. You'll see some drooping in some plants. You'll see leaves curl under and a lot of philodendrons. That's a sign. But if you get to know your plant, you'll know. Hmm. So when it comes to watering, you had mentioned earlier that you water it until it's all the way through. and You see water come out the bottom. Mm -hmm. Is that the case for every plant? I would for say, the most part. I would say so. Especially you were talking, Tony, about having succulents. And one of the biggest things is it's used to going months and months 
with just dry heat and then it gets a, it gets drenched right deluge and so they are drought tolerant uh, plants and so you want to again sort of mimic its natural environment and so g- research what those are and that's the best way to to know yeah, I think that one of the things that I've taken away from what she's told us is it's been a lot, right? It's been a lot. But here's, I think, one of the things. You're going to water a plant when the soil is dry, right? And maybe when it's uh, starting to show signs of needing some water. And then and then you're going to wait for that soil to dry out again completely before you're putting more water in there. If the soil is soft and and moist already then it's still got water and it doesn't need it and i think that's my number one thing we gotta take another quick break uh don't go away we'll be right back you're listening to tony corey your weekend warriors we'll see you in a minute Listening to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show, built by Par Lumber. When it comes to big or small projects around the home, Tony and Corey have got the know-how and the answers to make your life just a bit easier. Now, here's Tony and Corey. Hey, welcome back to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show, built by Par Lumber. I'm Corey Valdez. I'm Tony Cookston. Thanks for tuning in with us today. We've got uh, Aaron Harding. She's an author, blogger, and DIY care, a decor of interior plants. She's the creator and editor at cleverbloom.com. You can follow her blog and her Instagram at cleverbloom.com. You're also all over Pinterest, right? I am. Pinterest is one of those big ones that everybody goes to for ideas. I actually work for a Pinterest management company. That's my actual job. And so I'm on Pinterest a lot. There's tons of home improvement, plant. Every idea you could possibly need is well, on there. Well, Tony and I hope to add to that. Yes, Because absolutely. we, I really want to build some like planner boxes and some interior type things. One of the things you brought in with you today is one of the weirdest things I've ever seen in my life. They're <laughs> called air plants. Did you, have you ever, ever heard of air plants? No, not before Aaron showed them Can to I us. I see one of those? I mean, they're and, just the weirdest little I mean, it alien. looks completely normal except that it becomes weird in your mind when you realize it simply doesn't need soil to thrive. Yeah, it looks, like, it looks like a plant that you tore all the roots off. This looks like the top of a pineapple is what that looks like to it me. It really does. <laughs> it looks it does. like you took the pineapple off of the bottom and now it's growing and being great. Well, air plants are, the scientific name is Tillandsia, and they are plants that grow in their natural habitat Um, in the tufts of trees. Some of them um, will will grow along the ground, but they do not need soil to survive. And so what they do is they pull, they're they're epiphytic plants, which means that they pull their nutrients and their moisture from everything around them. So um, from the moisture in the air, they actually feed on the nutrients from the, the rotting bark of whatever tree they're on. So they're really, you know, pulling everything in and they don't need soil to survive. So as long as you give them decent sunlight and you water them as needed, they will continue to be pretty. And what's cool about air plants is you can find all sorts of fun DIYs uh, to display them. And so we were talking about that earlier. You can get super creative with ways to display these because they don't need to be in a pot. So it's perfect. Yeah. So when you're watering these, you spritz them with like a spray bottle or? A spritz is a snack. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so what we do okay, okay. is we soak them. So that's a meal. Oh, okay. okay. All right. So spritzing them, you can do if you feel like for some reason, maybe the bottom doesn't feel crunchy, but maybe the, the ends feel a little crunchy. You can do a little spritzing, but I, I prefer the full water to be soak. You soak them, just I soak them in my sink for about, I don't know, 15 to 20 minutes. I pull them out and then I actually sit them upside down so that the water doesn't stay inside. inside. Yeah. 
and you're good to go. You put it back in whatever display you made. That is so cool. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> these are really the coolest. They're so bizarre. You were talking about how these air plants uh, pull their what they need to survive from everything around them. So this brings me back. Uh, we talked about this uh, during the break, and everybody laughed at me, but I'm I'm coming right out with it. This is this is the nuts and bolts of this whole situation, right? Breaking it all the way down. Uh, just going to get real here. Corey, we talk about, this is one of your favorite questions you ask on the radio. You say, how many humidifiers do you have in your home? How many humidifiers do you have in your home? I think to myself, of course. How many do you have? Do you have any humidifiers in your house? I do for my plants. Okay, you have, a, have, you have a humidifier, so you have one. one humidifier in your house. This is Corey's favorite thing to ask because the fact is every human body that lives in your home is a humidifier. We create that when we exhale. We exhale carbon dioxide full of moisture, moisture right? And that's inside the house. And in the house, that moisture is looking to get out. And so it's going to the walls and, and doing that thing. Well, a plant requires that. That plant is going to take that. It's going to take your carbon dioxide. It's going to take your moisture and it's going to use it to thrive. So while you're talking about how your home is managing the moisture that you're creating inside the house, I can't think of a better way to control that naturally and beautifully than adding plants in the home that are begging for it. They're asking you, please exhale on me <laughs> so that I can grow and be a big, strong plant. That's, right? that's how plants love you back. That's what I'm saying. Do you see? Tony's it's, plants to be like, ooh, lay off the garlic. <laughs> <laughs> it's a give and take uh, thing that you've got going there. I love that. And then these plants create oxygen, which we breathe. And so I know you guys made fun of me. It's the whole circle of life thing. But the fact is, it's real. And for people that are living in their homes with no plants inside the house, missing a huge opportunity for multiple reasons, I feel. So like. deep. I know. It's just... I'm inspired. Aaron, you are here inspiring me to That's fill my for. house with indoor plants. And I, I'm thinking about all of the ways that, that, it's, love you. that it's going to benefit well, me. Well, people laugh, but there, you know, there are really quite a few benefits of having plants in your home. And um, it doesn't have to be like scientific. It's what, what benefits you. So what plants do for me may not do the same for you or for Corey or whoever. So um, it's really how you feel like they benefit you. And they do. I think they're, I think they're great. I love plants that bloom, um, which brings me back to my Christmas cactus, which I'm going to do better with. But you mentioned to me during the break that there's actually three different types of that plant, a Christmas cactus, an Easter cactus, and a Thanksgiving cactus. Well, I think people get them confused. That's why I said there's three different types. There's actually tons a Fourth of... Fourth of July cactus, maybe? <laughs> there's also <laughs> other species, but uh, sometimes they, they're so similar, and sometimes they get a little bit confused. There is a Christmas and a Thanksgiving and an Easter one, so they bloom during different times, so that's the best way to tell which one you have. It's the funniest thing because I remember having this conversation with somebody else who I thought had a Christmas cactus in their house and then uh, the Christmas cactus that we had in our house and the fact that they bloomed at different times and I did not understand that. Now and you know. now I know. The more you know. It's crazy to me. And knowing is half the battle. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, the air plants are very cool. We're going to need to do a how-to video. Uh, and how to make some displays. Yeah, make for some them. displays for those. I think that would be like a, that a very cool project. Uh, I think those are... I think those are very cool looking also. They're fun for beginners too, because one of the things I really try to stress with people who are trying to bring plants into their home is uh, it's okay to fail. You're not always going to keep every plant you bring into your home alive. So the thing I suggest is doing something on a smaller scale. First, getting uh, a, one of the four inch nursery pots, which is typically one of the smaller ones at a store and bringing it home and trying it out. That's exactly what I am gonna do. I've failed enough times, it's time for me to start succeeding. I'm gonna figure out a way to do that. We gotta take another quick break. When we come back, more with Aaron and Clever Bloom. You're listening to Tony Corey, your weekend warriors. Don't go away.
Hey everybody, here's a quick tip for you when you're using extension cords. If you have to plug in one of your tools, uh, a good thing to do is to tie the ends around like that and plug them in. So that way, if you're working with your tool and you get to the end of your extension cord, it just doesn't unplug or if it gets caught on something. So that'll help you uh, stay more productive. Hey, welcome back to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show. Hey, if you haven't already, go check out our Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram pages. We're at WW Home Show. We're uh, putting this show on YouTube right now. We're recording it for our video podcast. We've got Erin Harding in the studio with us. She's an author and blogger with the uh, Clever Bloom website. You're the creator and editor at that site. Tell everybody... What, how would they get a hold of you if they have questions? Didn't you say you were talking about your blog earlier? Yeah, you just, just go ahead and give us your cell phone number. Right, yeah, right, right. here. Give that out. People just call it you. It is up. the same one I've had for about 30 years. So, <laughs> no, that's yeah. Fine. So, the easiest way to contact me to ask me any sort of plant questions is usually through DMs on Instagram. I check those pretty regularly, and people will just ask questions um, about particular plants. They'll send pictures and say, What's wrong? So that's the best way. You can also comment or email through my website. Cleverbloom.com. That one's easy. Yeah, that is. It's, it's Where'd you come easy. up with the name? Clever it's, Bloom. She's not going to remember that. It's okay. I <laughs> I was I was really trained to think of, first of all, my grandma growing up called me clever from the time I can remember. She would, instead of saying, oh, you're cute, it was always like, you're so clever. And so she, <laughs> that really stuck. That's something that she always called me from day one. Huh. Um, my mom said it's because she thought I was sneaky, but... <laughs> Oh, anyway, she had a clever like a fox, right? Of the word clever, that's good but, stuff. So that's kind of where that came from. And then I didn't want to, bloom was just sort of obviously a word that sort of means beauty. And then a lot of houseplants plant, bloom and I just kind of put it together. I don't really know. How. Well, it's super very catchy. clever. Yeah, it is. <laughs> very clever. It's super catchy. I like it too. Um, so we've talked about a lot. We've talked about a lot of stuff. But one of the things that you mentioned, I think going right back to the Monstera, which I'm kind of hung up on. I don't know. <laughs> you said that you actually had a Monstera that you had taken a start um, yep. from another plant, a, a well-established plant. And you just took propagated a, a, it. a small start. Yeah. And then you took it home and you propagated it. Let's talk a little bit about that. I think um, people want to share plants. I hear of this all the time and they're like, oh, I can give you a start off of mine. And now you don't just have something that you grew from a seed or that you bought in a store, but you've got something that you got from mom or dad or grandma, right? That's super cool. But you get a start and then you take it home and then uh, what is somebody's best odds at having good success with a start from somebody else's plant? Sure. I mean, that's that's really the the beauty of plants is um, being able to pass them down from generation to generation. I have a jade plant that was um, a cutting from my grandmother's plant that she had for 30 years prior. And then, you know, I knew about the plant for 30 years. And then I took a cutting off of it after she passed. And now it's getting big. And so really the stories behind the plants are, are what's really cool. Um, but the best thing to do is most plants, not all, but most will will water propagate. And I feel like that's the easiest way, especially for a beginner. Um, so on the Monstera, for example, on the stem of the Monstera, there's an area that is the root node, which is an area that you'll find uh, has a little tiny sort of nub that kind of comes out. And what you do is a lot of plants have root node areas and you want to just sort of cut a little bit below that, I say about a quarter of an inch or so, and you just plop it in water. Water. That's all you do. Uh, give it the light it needs, but you just put it in water. And depending on the plant, you will see roots typically between um, one week and three weeks, depending on the plant. And a lot of plants, most of the plants I own, and I probably have, I don't know, about 80 plants, most of them will water propagate. So... So interesting. So you have it in uh, in a cup, I guess, of water. Yep. And uh, a clear cup, maybe, so you can see uh, down inside there. And then it'll just start to drop roots right out of the bottom of the start. So right where that little root node area was, um, in fact, I have a little picture in the book. 
right where that is sort of hanging oh, off, yeah. you cut r- right below that, and then that just continues to grow in the water. Oh, so okay. that's where the root forms. Oh, I see that right there. And we typically say between four and six inches of roots, it's time to put it in soil at that point. I okay. Was, that was my next question. How oh. do you know when to put it in soil? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, you have to have enough roots to know that, um, you know, we talked about the the root amount compared to how much soil you have in a pot. So obviously you don't want to put something that has little tiny roots in a big pot of soil. Um, that's too much to try to control. So you want to wait until the roots get a little bit bigger. I have a friend who has a monstera. It's been in water for two years. Oh, really? So the plant isn't thriving because it's not, it's put out a few new leaves. It doesn't have the nutrients from the soil, but the roots keep growing like crazy. As long as you fill it with water, the roots keep growing and growing and growing, and the plant's still alive. It's been two years. So. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That is. That's so let me ask you this. So you you put it in a pot that is just slightly larger than its root ball or whatever mm-hmm. you would call that. How do you know when it's time to upsize that pot? Sure. Uh, typically, a lot of times you'll see, you'll you'll start to see signs. One is, we talked about the watering before. If you see that the water's running out right away and it's been in that pot for a long time, there's a good chance that most of the dirt has sort of like disintegrated and it's mostly root. And so the water's just going straight through because it doesn't have the soil to, you know. Hold on to it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's one sign. Another sign is oftentimes you will actually see roots growing out of the drainage hole. Mm -hmm. I've seen that. It's time. Yeah. It's time to repot if that's the case. And And another one of the things I've done wrong. Okay, I've got that. Another thing is you'll realize um, oftentimes succulents and cacti, they have smaller root systems, so they don't need to be repotted nearly as much as plants like philodendrons or pothos or or anything like that. But one of the things uh, I do is even if I don't see actual signs of um, the roots being too much for the pot, I typically repot about once every two years, even if I if I don't see the signs. Another thing I do is every year, if I don't think it needs a new pot necessarily, it doesn't need a bigger pot, I do a top dressing of new soil because it, at some point, even like if it's been a year, it takes all the nutrients out of the soil and it's used it all up, right? So at some point, it doesn't have the food anymore to... Continue to grow. Right. right. And so a lot of times I'll put like a top dressing of soil, maybe about an inch or two on the top and just mix it in with the old stuff. And then that's good for another, you know, six months, two years. That so. was actually another question of mine is <laughs> nutrients. It's like I'm reading your I head. know. Like how do you know sure. when to add? Is that what you do to add nutrients? You know, do you throw Miracle Girl on there? Is that like a big no-no? No, I mean, you know, you you decide what's best for your plants. So there's tons of different brands. I've used Miracle Grow before. They actually have a great uh, house plant fertilizer that's in a pump. It's a foam, so you just pump a f- little bit of foam on top of the soil, and then you water like normal. Um, typically, you want to fertilize in the spring and in the summer. And then a little bit like I'm just now stop. I just did my last fertilizing on my plants. So now that we're getting into the fall, uh, you want to hold back on the fertilizing. Some of the plants sort of go, for lack of a better word, dormant. And so you don't want to water as much. You don't want to fertilize. You just want them to sort of make it through the winter. (laughs) And then you can start uh, kind of feeding it again in the spring. So there's tons of different kinds. Some people use granules. Some people use miracle Grow. There's tons of different brands. But depending on if there's certain things that are important to you, chemicals, no chemicals, there's also natural um, fertilizers. You just decide what's best for you and your plants. And then that's what you use. And like I said, uh, typically in the spring and summer, depending on what the fertilizer is, I do it about every um, three to six weeks. That's a very good tip. Yeah, that... I didn't even I, I didn't even think yeah. about that. I, I had a question about it because I, you said it would run out. 
nutrients run out. Yeah, absolutely, of course. But that makes perfect sense. You can just replace it right in the dirt that it's in, or you can replant it with some new soil that's got those nutrients in it. I actually, when we come back, have a great miracle grow story for you. So I'm really glad you segued that for me. We've got to take a quick break. You listen to Tony Core, your weekend warriors. Don't go away. Our Lumber is committed to providing the best customer service. We provide personal service. We're problem solvers. We're positive and courteous. We're competent and professional. We are committed to delivering exceptional service every time. We're appreciative and we care. We are Par Lumber. Hey, welcome back to the Weekend Warriors Home Improvement Show. Thanks for staying in this with us. We've got uh, Aaron Harding in the studio with us from Clever Bloom. She's an author and blogger on uh, cleverbloom.com. And uh, we've been talking about plants. And before the break, we were talking a little bit about nutrients for plants. And I had mentioned Miracle, Miracle Grow. Grow. Yeah. And uh, you, Aaron, you said that's perfectly okay. Tony, you said you had a miracle oh, grow yeah, it's got story. A great miracle grow story. Okay, so my my mother and father in law are snowbirds, and they go back and forth to Arizona every year, uh, Yuma, I think, and uh, they spend months there. And uh, they love the cactuses and the dry weather and the heat, and it's it just makes them so happy. It's their favorite place to be uh, during the winter here because it's so cold and yuck, right? They got it all figured out. Well, so I don't know. Ten years ago, my father comes. My father in law comes home with a start from a cactus. Uh, it's a flat, like, petal-type cactus with things. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, yeah, a puntia. A, punti- a prickly pear. Oh, a prickly yeah. pear. Okay, that's what I heard him call it. Okay. So he comes back with this, and he's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plant this here. And I'm thinking to myself, that cactus is probably not going to grow here, right? It's <laughs> Because it's cold, and it's rainy, and it's yuck. But he planted that thing, and I'll tell you, he was bound and determined that he was going to make it work. So he takes this single plate or pedal. Yeah. Plate, paddle. Paddle. Yeah. Paddle. yeah, yeah. Takes the single paddle and he digs a little tiny hole and he just sets it. On the ground. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I, wait, outside. Yeah. Outside next to his uh, shop, right next to his shop door. So he just scrapes a little line in the ground and he sets this paddle on the ground and he pushes the dirt up next to it. Right. And he's like, okay, there it goes. And I thought, there's no way in the world this is going to happen. Well, he starts putting miracle Grow on it. Nobody knew he was using miracle Grow, but he's using miracle Grow, And this thing blooms. And the next thing you know, it's got like four more paddles. And those four became 24, which became 124. And then the next thing you know, this thing was six feet tall. And I am not exaggerating. Six feet wide. You couldn't even get into his shop door anymore. He had to go around. It was so big. Oh, wow. And the the paper, the local paper came out and did a piece on it. <laughs> and they were like, look at this giant cactus that Hillsboro man has grown in his. And it had yellow blooms all over it. And it was just enormous. Anyways, since then, he has them now all over around his house. He has them all. He gives them away. Come on over. He says, come on over. I'll give you a start off of my cactus and he does and there we now have one it's got about eight paddles on it and it's absolutely great i just absolutely love it some things do really good and uh i never imagined that that would grow here yeah i mean that's something you see all over arizona like you said my husband's from arizona and it it's grows like a weed there i mean you know his mom has people come out and you know Remove get him oh, right right <laughs> and it just makes me cringe because one paddle here at at a boutique nursery is probably 20 30 dollars wow and so every time she cuts it down i'm like ah it just like that's makes a, me a cringe gold mine. What and like are you doing? 20 40 60 80 there yeah, you go like, can you just ship them to me <laughs> right yeah, i'll, I'll right. pedal my paddles <laughs> well that is fun because that is the fun part of being able to travel some um In the States, I do try to bring plants back from different states when I go to visit. Um, And so it's fun. I have cuttings from my friend in Florida. And when we go to Arizona and I've picked some stuff up in California and Detroit. And so it's just it's fun to be able and you can take them on your carry on. 
So it goes right through the uh, <laughs> the old that's great the old thing there, and Absolutely they great. they get through. So it is fun to be able to share and to be able to say, "Hey, I have this cactus from my dad who grew it from you know," and it's just it puts a story behind a plant, which makes it even better. So I I like tropical plants. I feel like that I would love to have a palm tree or something in my house. But uh, how do you know about something like that? Can you grow? I mean, I don't know. Sure. Right? You're, you said earlier something that sort of inspired me a little bit. You said you want to treat it inside your home the the way that it's, it is treated when it's outside in its natural place. Mm -hmm. And so um, palm tree should be easy, right? Just a little bit of water every, you know, 322 days and you then a lot of sunlight. <laughs> I actually have a majesty palm in my house. It's about six feet tall or so. Um, but again, it's trying to just figure out how do I give it what it needs as much as possible. And so it's in my south facing window again. And, you know, I water it however often I make sure it has the right soil. So you can really grow quite a variety of plants indoors. I will say, I mean, I have some orchids. I also do mounted plants that we sort of uh, talked about during the break where they hang on my wall. Um, I do use a grow light for them. They needed a little bit more um, light in the area that they were in, but it was really the only wall I could use that on. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's just, if you bring a plant in, you try to give it what it what it gets in what its, its natural environment. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Um, how about a banana plant? <laughs> I don't. I don't want to touch a banana plant. Yeah, I don't either. Um, so I do have a real good question for you. Um, we talked about. I'm back to it again. The monstera, mm -hmm. and you said that thing was really big. That one that you took the start off of. So there are some plants that you have inside the house that could continue to grow and get bigger and bigger, and maybe even. Bigger than you anticipated. Yes. What are your tips for controlling the growth or maybe trimming back sure. or removing some portions of a plant without damaging it? Yeah. Uh, so what I suggest is I, I've had people, again, message me on Instagram and say, this plant is out of control. I can't, <laughs> I don't have room for it anymore. And it's this giant monster. And it's like, well, yeah, those things grow you know, in Costa Rica, I saw them. They were huge. I mean, they they get so tall. And so you have to kind of know what you're bringing into your house. But you can, like you said, sort of trim them up. And the, the cool part about that is if you cut them in the right place, you can propagate them and give them to friends or repot them up for yourself. So that's what I suggest. Once they start to get out of hand or you feel like they're too big and you can't, con you know, you can't take care of it anymore mm -hmm. or whatever... Um, again, I would just try to find, and you can Google this or look on Pinterest or whatever, but each plant's a little bit different. But typically, if you can find that root node on the on the plant, you just cut below there. And you can take different cuttings and trimmings all around the plant, stick them in water, wait for them to root, and then you can pot them up. So it's, it's a smart idea to do that. If they start to get too big, what's cool about the Monstera, though, I will say, as the, as the leaf gets bigger and as they grow... Um, they start to get fenestrations, the little holes in the the ribbing area, um, which is so cool. So they get even more tropical looking as they get bigger. So oh, sometimes just... you have to wait for that cool leaf to grow. <laughs> <laughs> I need to find somebody that's got a big one and wants to give me a start. Monstera, it's a tropical plant. Is it something that you can buy locally? Oh, yeah. Oh, you can. You can, you can find them at pretty much any... Um, local nursery or even um, har hardware stores tend to have them. So you could um, find find that somewhere there. But again, if you have a friend, <clears throat> I don't know of a friend that might have one, but if you have a friend <laughs> that might have one, you know, you could just beg her for a cutting. Um, and I'm sure she would give you one. But that's the thing. Uh, you can find, pl and you can find smaller versions of Monstera also. And then there's different variety. Monstera is one type of plant that has a bunch of different hmm. varieties. So you can find um, smaller uh, leaved Monsteras as well. Oh, cool. Okay. Like a toy. Here's, yeah. a t here's a question for you. I'm putting you on the spot. I want your honest opinion about this. Okay. How do you feel about plastic plants? <laughs> oh, my God. 
I go through Ikea, right? And you come out the backside and they have carts and carts and carts of plastic mm-hmm. plants, which require zero water. Or care. Or-, or care or anything. Okay. So I'm just saying, if you have some live plants and some plants that maybe aren't entirely alive, is that a terrible thing? Now, before you answer, because I really want you to think about this, I have several of those as well. It's some of my greenest and most beautiful plants. Right. Perfect. Are plastic. That's right. We're going to talk about that as soon as we come back. One more break. You listen to Tony Corey, Your Weekend Warriors. Don't go away. Hey, welcome back to the We Hit Warriors Home Improvement Show. Thanks for sticking with us. Today in the show, we've got Erin Harding. She's an author and blogger at cleverbloom.com. She's also the creator and editor at Clever Bloom. She's written a book called How to Raise a Plant. And make it love you back. And according to her grandmother, she literally is a clever bloom. <laughs> so it, it's it's very That's fitting. True. Yeah. So Job. before the break, Tony, you had asked a really weird question about plastic plants. So what are your thoughts on plastic plants? <laughs> I mean, I have mine. Uh, yes, I think but it's weird. I did notice you guys are gradually making your way into real plants, which I appreciate. Yes. Um, I mean, come on, what? You don't don't have to answer. I do. I do believe that, um, even just having some sort of nature in your house, whether it be plastic or not, actually can really be mood changing. I really do believe that. So if that's what you need in your dungeon, uh, to be able to be in a better mood, then I'm all for it. But I would say, um, you know, plants aren't super expensive. So you could spend, you know, $4 on a plant and just see what you can do with it. See yeah. if you can, you know, get it growing and yeah. make it love you back. We'll call tip. it, good we'll, tip. we'll call them gateway plants. Gateway. The plastic yes. plants are gateway plants. Introductory. Yes. A new life where you have life inside of your house. I'll tell you what, we do have plastic plants in our bonus room that we never go into. So <laughs> it actually much? makes it's sense. Probably yeah, best that's probably a good plastic. idea. That's we don't want to show up there, you know, in four months and go, oh, dang it. Yeah. Right. Forgot about those. So uh, anyway, let's talk a little bit about, I have a question about your book, or Tony had a question about your book. Why don't you ask that? Because you asked it during the break, yeah, and I don't know how to word it. It's a very kind of weird, touchy-feely question, but look, a very small percentage of the population of the Earth has the wherewithal to conceive of something like this, a book, and then to act on it and make it happen. And so you must have had feelings like, I don't know if anybody's going to want to read it, or, or how, how will it be received? Is it even going to be great? Um, and I'm taking a huge chance. How has finishing it and having it printed and having it selling all over and all of the amazing things, how has it changed you? I knew my mom would read it. I knew one person would read yeah. it, right? <laughs> Just like we so, know Tony's mom listens to this show. That's right. She Aww, does. Yep. She was our, see, she's one of the few. The yep. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, my co-author Morgan Doan, it, she, we created sort of an online houseplant community to start with. And that was really something that was important to us because we realized that people had the love for plants, but they didn't quite know what to do with them. Right. So we wanted to just create this environment house plant club, which is, I thought was kind of cool because, you know, you weren't always invited to the cool clubs when you're in high school, Right. but this is a club that everyone can be a part of. And so what we did was we created this space on Instagram where people could message us if they had questions or problems or wanted to identify a plant. And we started sharing images and photos of plants. And some of them were in our house and some of them were in homes of friends of ours and so on and so on. And so through that, we worked on this community for a couple of years and we were approached by Lawrence King, our publisher, and they said, we love what you're doing with Houseplant Club. We would like to turn it into a book. And so that's how that came about. And the first thing that actually, okay, Morgan was on her way to Cali, Columbia on an airplane. She said, it's really expensive for you to text me. Do not text me or call me unless it's really important. <laughs> so I get this email like just a few hours after she leaves, right? And I thought, 
this is important enough, right? So I, I text her and I said, you have to call me as soon as possible. I have something really important to tell you. So the first it, it thought in my mind was no way. There's no way I could write a book because I just, it, it's not something, I'm, I'm a creative mind, but I'm not necessarily uh, very good at the words, if you will. <laughs> so I thought, okay, well, I don't know if we can do this, but I called her and I said, they want us to write a book. And she's like, tell them yes. Just tell them I'm on vacation. I'll be back in a week, but yes. And I'm like, okay, I guess we're doing it. <laughs> so it was really scary for me at first because I thought, can I do it? And the, the second thought in my mind was, who's going to read it? <laughs> and I, so that was definitely one of the first of many thoughts in my mind. Um, and I think what I realized through all this was number one, you can do anything you put your mind to. It was not easy and it was hard. And I had two little kids at home, but I had a husband who was willing to basically take over. And then I worked during the day and then I did the book at night. And so, um, it can, it can happen. One of the things that I realize though, is it's been able to kind of connect me to other people in the community, like you guys yeah. and other people who are interested in plants, but just don't know enough about them to really like take the next step. So for me, um, my, my favorite part of this is meeting people in the community, having people contact me saying, Hey, I'm opening a studio and I want you know, you to come in and do some plant design or, Hey, we want to do a, uh, workshop and we want you to, you know, do this. And so there's been a lot of community contacts that have been really fun for me. Um, but have I changed? I don't know if I'm the right person to ask <laughs> about that. I think ultimately I have felt more empowered to know that I can do things that I didn't think I could do before. And so I think that's my biggest takeaway from it. Well, that's very cool. I think it's very cool. And I'm going to write a book. Do it. Do it. I'm going to write a book about how to be best friends with Corey Valdez. I'll read it. You, I, That's all I needed. That's <laughs> right there. That's a very exactly, long book. That's what I needed. <laughs> complicated um, and long. This time of year, we're going into the winter months. Yes. And so you did mention that there are some um, things that you should consider with your plants, your indoor plants, as you're going into the winter months. Um, what is probably the thing that people do wrong. What do plant parents do wrong? What's the number one <laughs> the most common mistakes? thing that uh, plant parents do wrong? Yeah. Uh, the number one mistake is over watering your plants. I think people tend to go, Oh, my plant looks this way. And then they just water it. That's because that's what you're giving it personally is water. Um, you can't give it the sunlight and you can't give it, you know, the soil, but you're the one that's, watering it. And so you feel like if you water it more, then you're giving it more love. <laughs> but that's not necessarily true. So uh, overwatering uh, creates a lot of problems. It creates root rot, um, fungal disease, all sorts of things that can ultimately kill your plant. So you definitely want to not overwater your plant. I would um, probably let your plant show you signs of um, dehydration over <laughs> watering it too much. Yeah. So that's the number one thing, but, uh, that kind of goes into preparing your plants for fall and winter. The one thing is you definitely need to lay off the watering. So where we gave the example earlier, snake plants in the summertime, sometimes, uh, two to three weeks, every two to three weeks you water it. You can't water it that often. I would go more like every four to six weeks in the fall and winter on types of plants like that. Um, so just really pay attention to the soil and the plant. Um, and then per pest prevention is really important. You start to get um, fungus gnats a lot in the fall and winter because they want to live in those moist areas. And if you have really mo moist soil, they're going to just dig in there, lay thousands of eggs, and all of a sudden you're just going to have them all over your house. So pest prevention is really important. Like I said, I use a systemic granule and you just sort of do it in the top of the soil and then you water it and then that sort of helps Runs that. down in there, yeah. Um, light, a lot of times people move their um, plants around in the fall and winter, so you want to chase the light. Um, I also use um, grow lights for some plants that I know aren't getting nearly as much as they need. 
But like I mentioned before, the amount of light it's getting is equal to the amount of water you want to give it. So be careful with that. And then do not fertilize. That's one of the other things too. You want to lay off the fertilizing. Don't do that again till spring. During the winter. No miracle right. grow, Corey. Did you no. hear that? <laughs> I heard it. No miracle grow during the winter months. Uh, well, that is uh, that is a lot of information. I have gathered so much information, I feel like. Um, but I want to share what we know with everyone out there, how to get a hold of your book, how to get a hold of all of that amazing stuff that's in your brain. Uh, the first way is Instagram at Clever Bloom, right? And the website, cleverbloom.com. That's correct. It's spelled just like you think, folks. Clever Bloom at Clever Bloom and cleverbloom.com. And you can get the book at one of those two places. Is it for sale at... Um, other places you can you can find the book on amazon or target.com or uh you know, most places that sell books but how to raise a plant and make it love you back absolutely love it Aaron thank harding thank you so much for being thank with us this is an amazing was show fun. it was great to have you i think that's all the time we got thanks for tuning in this has been another episode of your weekend warriors right here on the weekend warriors radio network have a great week